From the mountains of Utah to the East Bay of Northern California, this is the Green and Gold Podcast. Welcome everyone, my name is Adam Ames. I am the curator here at the unofficial Oakland Athletics YouTube channel. In this podcast, we will attempt to discuss the team from all vantage points and all eras. With me for this ride is my tag team partner, lifelong friend and ace fanatic, Michael Go. Hey Adam, how's it going? Uh been a while since we did one of these shows and i'm happy to be back and doing it again yeah man i had some personal issues come up you know some family emergencies and and some other things but you know it's 2019 now and you know baseball is just around the corner and i can't wait for the first pitch at the oakland coliseum and they started games today or at least a couple of days ago uh the a's and the mariners have started playing and i think the first game if i recall was uh sort of a wash i think it was a rain out and then a power outage afterwards but uh i think they started playing the games and getting this year rolling and uh, i for one i i can't wait to see what the a's are going to do this year so i thought we would start this episode off with a story about the a's and you know maybe we can make this a regular thing before we get into the meat of uh what we're going to do so i live in utah and of course you know there's not a whole lot of northern california folks here you know a lot from Southern California Dodgers fans and whatnot. But one night, you know, at like eight o'clock, I had to go down to the dollar store to, to get some batteries. And the cashier saw that I was wearing my ace hat and my ace shirt. And he kind of looked me up and down a little bit. He says, hey, you from you from Oakland? I said, yeah, I was born there. You know, I lived there all, you know, most of my uh, you know, adult life up until I was 18 or so. And he said, well, what do you know about the A's? I said, well, I know a lot. You know, I research things. And he said, he said, well, nothing can beat the, the 70s teams of Reggie Jackson and um, Catfish Hunter and Raleigh Fingers. And, you know, he kind of went on and on, talked about those guys. And, you know, I said some, I said some things. I said, man, I, I wish I was, I was there to see those teams. That would have been so awesome. And he kind of looked at me and goes, uh, you're too young for that. I don't, I don't know if I believe you. I said, yeah, I, I really do. He said, I'll tell you what. I will give you those batteries for free if you can name three players on that team. And I'm talking about Reggie and Catfish and those guys. Name three others. And immediately I said, Bill North and Ken Holtzman and Sal Bando. And he kind of looked at me and smiled. Then he kind of waved his hand. He said, go ahead, man. They're yours. <laughs> yeah, you showed him, huh? Hey, man, I got $4 worth of free batteries for knowing my hey. Oakland Athletics history. So hey, hey, hey. Who, who's to say this kind of uh, knowledge isn't worth anything? <laughs> uh, let's rewind first a little bit to, to 2018. And I mean, 97 wins. <laughs> There's nobody would have thought that 97 wins the A's would have would have come up with for the 2018 season. No, not at all. I don't think uh, anybody expected the A's to come anywhere close to 80 90, let alone 97 wins uh, in, in a lot of divisions. I think the A's would have placed first uh, in a lot of years, if not last year. Ended up uh, running into the Yankees in the wild card game. And, I mean, in my personal opinion, I think the uh, the weaknesses showed there with the starting, uh, starting pitching. And uh, it was just unfortunate. But, uh, gosh, who would have expected it? I... I, I, being an ace fan as I am, as optimistic as I am, I would not have predicted that. Not at all. I would have been happy with a over 500 year to get to the playoffs the way they did. Uh, it was it was amazing to see see the young players, see Chapman come up and and Matt Olson just kind of grow into the players that they become and just the future just seems really bright. I went back and did a little bit of, of uh, digging up and do a little bit of research. And I found out that the 22 win differential between 2017 and 2018 was the third best in Oakland history. The biggest one was from 79 to 80 when they went from 54 wins to 83 wins. And then um, in 1987 to 1988, they went from 81 to 104. So this was a historical team. And if you look back on some of the stats that these guys put up, their career years, it's down the entire lineup. You look at guys like Piscotti, Davis, and Pinder, Canna, Marcus Simeon turned things around. Uh, Lowry had a career year, but he's no longer with the team. Can Blake Trinan have another Eckersley-type season? 
you know, can Trevino have another uh, <laughs> Gene Nelson type of season where, you know, you bring those two guys in and it's curtains for the other team. Can these guys really do it again two years in a row? Uh, the only guy that's missing this year that was a huge part last year is Jed Lowry. And he really will be missed on that second base spot. And his veteran presence is just is really going to be sorely lacking on this young A's lineup. Um, his replacement, uh, Jurickson Profar, not too shabby a hitter himself, but just I, I don't think he carries that same gravitas that... Jed Lowry, with his years of experience with the team in the division and just being in the game, uh, carries. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how Profar fits into that mold. You have to ask yourself, what's more important? Is the veteran leadership that Lowry had more important? Or is it Profar putting up the numbers that Lowry did? Tough to say. Um, It's so hard to gauge leadership clubhouse presence um team chemistry as opposed to raw numbers uh, and and, you and i both know numbers are great and they they project great on a stat sheet but overall how much can you really factor in a hundred percent of those stats to wins and how the team performs in, in in intense clutch situations um i'm hoping profar comes up big and he comes up uh, with offensive numbers that at least at the very least match his career averages it's going to depend a lot on how much the young kids has matured over last year it's, it's going to be guys like Fowler what's what's his role going to be is he going to be the guy that we traded Sonny Gray for that we expected or is he just going to be another trading piece and Loriano, where did he come from you know what I mean I mean, he, all he did was throw a like a Death Star laser beam to first base from... He pulled up Roberto Clemente, for heaven's sakes. Sometimes, uh, you know, and I think every... There are, yeah, I, I don't want to use the, the, the term championship team, but every winning team, they come up with guys like that. Guys that are not the superstars. They're, they're not the high-priced players, but they come up out of nowhere seemingly and they're playing for a spot and they play so well they get that spot and they just grab hold of the opportunity and they just run with it and I think uh, Loriano was one of those guys and even Canna last year uh, went through his streaks and and he hit some really really clutch home runs and drove in some runs when they needed it for some big wins last year when the last couple of years beforehand, you were starting to think, or at least I was starting to think, you know, I wonder if he, if he has a place on this team. Yeah, you know, I've always liked Kenna. I'm a Kenna guy. Uh, I thought he had a great uh, rookie season in 2015. But I also want to bring up Chad Pinder because I think he's probably the most underrated of all the A's players. You can put him anywhere. He's essentially Tony Phillips out there, and you're going to get a good defense, defensive performance out of him. Yes, and I think that's that's something that that uh, every team has now, and uh, uh, at least the really good winning teams. Uh, Houston had and lost <laughs> Marvin Gonzalez, who I believe played every position on that team except pitcher and catcher. Uh, uh, he signed a two-year contract with the Twins, I believe. And uh, you're right, the Tony Phillips comparison is, is great uh, because you always need a guy like that Baseball is a 162-game sport. You can't compare it to any other sports. Your body gets beat up, and game after game, day after day, you're almost out there, and you need that guy to plug in. And Pinder has, uh, in addition to that, he, he's he got some pop. It, that, that guy can hit. He hit one above the sweets in left center field, right around in that area. I mean, goodness gracious, that that is... That's Nelson Cruz territory out there. That was probably one of the longest home runs I've seen hit in the Coliseum, either live or on TV. Runner goes, trying to steal third, and that one is belted to left center field, and that baby's gone even further than the last two. Wow. Did that go above the suites? Yes, it did. They are scrambling for it above the lower level suites. That ball was crushed. And we 
go. High drive center field. Burns giving ground. Looking up. Wow. Boom, step baby in the middle deck. Way out of here. A two run homer by Nelson Cruz. And the Mariners take over with a 4 2 lead. I, I've seen a lot of baseball games and played a lot of baseball games in this ballpark. I have never seen anybody hit one in center field up into the seats. We, so we've seen a lot of people hit the concrete wall. What extension he ends up getting on this. Yeah, that ball was touched. Woo. Exit velocity 112 miles an hour. I have never seen anybody hit one up there. The current roster has a ton of players who are 30 years or younger. Uh, who do you think is going to take over that veteran leadership role, if anybody, if it even matters? Well, from this team, the veteran leadership is going to come from guys like Piscotti and... Um, uh, Chris Davis, maybe. Chris Davis, uh, Marcus Simeon. You, you don't normally think that, but I believe he is the longest tenured athletic, which you and I would never think to say three years ago that we would have a pretty darn good athletic defensive team. But that is what they got. They've got two gold glovers in, in the corner spots. Profar is not too shabby at second base. He definitely has a bit more range than Jed. Perhaps not as sure-handed, perhaps not as great with the routine, but younger, more athletic. Simeon has improved immensely at sh shortstops uh, to the point where he got considered for a gold glove last year. Can you think of anybody in the majors right off the top of your head who has made such a turnaround defensively than Marcus Simeon. He was a joke. <laughs> it was pretty bad, but uh, but uh, Ron Washington really, really worked hard with him, and he worked hard, and and uh, it looks like they, they saw the results. Because of uh, some defensive struggles by the team, mostly by myself. Simeon had it, and just could not hold on to it. He wasn't coaching or managing at the time, and Billy Bean called him up and said, I have a kid that needs your help. What, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm working at the academy. I'm doing little odd things here and there. He said, you ready to go back to work? I said, yeah. He said, this kid needs you, and you need this kid. We've made it to the halfway point of the show, and that means it's time for the A's ad break. The Oakland A's were first to use a computer time. to make complicated baseball decisions. Surface. Surface. Forecast. Fair. Any words? TV. Getting close. TV. TV, yeah. I hope it's a green one. Green jerseys, white pants, green socks. All right! All right. All right. So the rookie fell for the old gonna be in a video game trick, huh? Yeah. You guys get that one? Oh yeah, we got that one. <laughs> Raleigh Fingers is an A's legend. The players really look up to him. Raleigh. Hey, Dallas Brain, pleasure to meet you. Hi, Dallas, how are you? Good, I'm such a big fan. I even got this tattoo in honor of you. Oh, wow. I've got another one on my arm. You riding a dolphin? I drew your portrait myself, you know, from memory. That's a pretty nice dolphin, Dallas. But my favorite of you has got to be the one on my lower back. Check it out. Whoa, I'm, I'm cool. There's always been a, a respect issue with the A's and the national media or the critics or however you want to categorize those people. And I don't want to hear excuses about, oh, well, they, they play on the West Coast. They're in a small market. The game's in too late. That's got nothing to do with anything these days. Media is available and more so than it's been in our entire lifetime. It's go on YouTube, watch the clips, and report on good teams. And the A's were a good team last year. No excuse not to cover them. So even in the late 80s and early 90s when they were winning uh, when they won the World Series and they went to three straight World Series, even the local media, it was almost always about the Giants. And I, I still cannot, for the life of me, understand that. And it kind of went further. I mean, I don't know what it was like in the 70s if the A's had the respect of the national media. You know, we weren't around then to, to talk about that. But 
If you go even further during the early 2000s with Zito, Mulder, and Hudson, there was still that, eh, it's Oakland, eh, you know, very dismissive. They had went over 100 games, and it's like, eh, you know, I'm not really interested in, in anything, you know, you guys have to do. And I guess to be, you know, if you want to be honest or play the other side of it, is the A's always found a way to choke somehow, some way. And you know, maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe it doesn't. But with this particular group of uh, players that we have in 2018, there were four players in the top 20 of the MVP voting. Two Gold Glove Award winners, as you mentioned earlier. And they still can't get any respect. Are you familiar with the uh, baseball prospectus, Picota Projections, which projects the win and loss total every year for all the teams? And looking at this year's projections... The A's, even with their 97 win total from last year, are projected to place third in the American League West behind the Houston Astros and the Los Angeles Angels with a 79 wins. I think that just goes to show how really unknown of a quantity the A's have in their starting rotation and even in last couple of years when the starting rotation and starting pitching has kind of fallen by the wayside in terms of uh, respect even if you look at it um people still put a lot of stock in starting pitching you know they still want to see the garrett coles out there and the justin verlanders and and the matt scherzers coming out and throwing seven innings and eight innings when even though that's not really how the game is played nowadays they still judge a whole team by that and uh to be honest, the question marks on the A's rotation is, it's huge. It's hard to ignore that the A's got by last year with Edwin Jackson and Brett Anderson and Trevor Cahill and lost Sean Manaya to injury and Jarrell Cotton to Tommy John. It's just just one after the other, just decimated by injuries or ineffectiveness. And it finally caught up with them in the playoffs. And I think a lot of people are still wondering, what can the A's do? What have they done to improve this year on that aspect? And the only thing I can see is they re-signed Mike Fires to a contract. I think that's where we want to be. You know, a team that's kind of under the radar and uh, teams figuring that they're just going to come in and, and kind of walk over this team. You know, this organization knows what they're doing and they, they know how to put together a team and, you know, I just want to be, you know, one of those five guys starting and get the opportunity to kind of lead these guys. And Yeah, I like Fires a lot, and uh, I am predicting that he's going to be the opening day starter, so we'll, we'll see how that one, uh, that one turns out. But if we look down the road, there are some bright spots within the A's organization with the uh, trifecta of uh, Sean Murphy, uh, A.J. Puck, and uh, Jesus Lazardo. You end up catching, you know, dozens of guys through the course of the season, and... Uh... You know, spring training is the best time to get to know each of them, you know, as as much as you can and, uh, you know, pick their brains and see what they try and do, you know, specifically for each guy. And uh, it's, you know, a tall order, but, uh, you know, you try and keep a notebook on certain guys and, and to make sure that when you do catch them, when the season comes around, that they're comfortable throwing to you and you're, you know, you're comfortable calling their pitches. It's really kind of just staying with myself, um, you know, just doing what I've been doing, telling myself that, you know, um, I had a successful year last year, thankfully, uh, thank God, and uh, just trying to keep doing that and keep working on it and uh, keep perfecting my craft, uh, not try to get ahead of myself or think what can happen in the future, just kind of, I try to take it day by day and uh, try to do something every day to get better. Throughout the season, I just tried to focus on, uh, you know, my team and getting wins, but, you know, it's always in the, you know, the back of my mind, like, oh, you know, I, I could be this, I could go here, you know, it's, it's all over, but, you know, I was happy, uh, happy that, uh, you know, we'll, Everything uh, happened, uh, you know, for a reason, and I'm um, happy I'm an A. If he does that well in spring training, then I'm really eager to see Sean Murphy come up and uh, see what he can do in the catching position. Yeah, I'm really optimistic about uh, Sean Murphy coming up and everything that I've uh, viewed and everything that I've read about him, like screams, uh, you know, intelligence and uh, the the field leader if you will, and for being such a young guy, uh, it seems like he's got a great head on his shoulders, and from a defensive standpoint, uh, he seems to be uh, excellent. 
it's been a while since the Yankees have had a catcher that you could pencil in day in and day out for the most part. Uh, you know, maybe Kurt Suzuki was the last one I can think of and Ramon Hernandez before then. Going back further, Terry Steinbach. So I hope he can add his plaque to the names of great ace catchers in the past. So I want to end the show talking about the front office and the strides that they've made to make the Coliseum a little bit more uh, fan friendly. Everything from the Shy Park Tavern, the little A's mu- uh, Philadelphia A's Museum they have, uh, the food trucks and the, the game passes and the tree house and, you know, the concession discounts and the A's access. They have done so much to help get the fans into Oakland, try to connect with the fans of Oakland, uh, with the mural stomper in the town. All these types of things are critical to connecting with those fans. And the current front office leadership has done more for Oakland, has done more for the A's, has done more for the Coliseum, and done more for the fans than any ownership dating back to Walter Haas. It's a nice push. A lot of people might be uh, pessimistic about it and say like, oh, well, it's just a big marketing push. But hey, you know, every bit, every ball team has a marketing push. And if you're going to do it, why not involve the community? Why not let people know that, hey, you know, your, we, we are your team. We represent your city. And not enough, not enough sports teams do that, period. It's just pure marketing. And they are shameless in their attempts to get your money. But at the very least, as, as much as, uh, as old as the Coliseum is and as unattractive it is to today's audience, what it does is it puts a focus on the team on the field. And it puts a focus on what that team does for the community as opposed to having a ballpark purely for tourist purposes i'm sorry to say and i think that's one of the positives that you have with a good ball team a good young ball team that is in a park that is not really all that glamorous and i would like to see that the city rewarded with their loyalty to this team and vice versa with a ballpark anywhere at this point (laughs) Anyway, and I think it's a shame that uh, when people talk about the Oakland A's, that the only thing they are able to talk about in a lot of ways is the ballpark. And that just goes to show how teams that have ballparks that fill up every night and they boast about sellouts and they boast about how many fans they bring in each year, it just goes to show how... How many of those fans actually go there to watch the team, as opposed to how many fans go there to say, oh, I was there? Well, hopefully, you and I will both be there at the Oakland Coliseum in October of this year when the A's get into the playoffs and really make that World Series run, something we've waited for since 1989. And that's it for us. For Michael Goh, I am Adam Ames, and we are out.